Close and secure all possible entrances to your home. Switch off all lights. Do not look out of any windows. Do not respond to any knocks on your windows or doors until the all clear is given. Remain silent at all times. It's like, this dude's too cool for long sentences. He said the key words. He said, streaming live around the world, this is Paper Cuts. We call it a poop bag. With Brad and Jay. Yeah, it's got a new show. It came to you, like, basically straight from my brain. We're not going to have those devil books in here. We are live. Holy cow, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to another exciting episode of Paper Cuts. Brad, do you think we have any uh, returning fans after last week's show? Oh, no, they all abandoned us. The <laughs> ship has sunk, Jay. <laughs> yeah, that was... Uh... That was that was harsh, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'm still cleaning paint off my face, by the way. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that one, the big spot look is <laughs> gone now. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's some you know one of those magic erasers. Yeah. <laughs> so for those joining us, thank you so much. Thank you for uh, coming back. That's Brad over there. I'm Jay. But you know what? Enough about us. Yeah, we need to introduce our guest for the evening. Uh, we couldn't be more excited about this award winner author joining us this evening. Uh, Bram Stoker Award winner. Several other awards, but if I start naming them, we'll be here till Sunday. <laughs> so let's just skip all those. The author of the Cipher, Velocity, Skin, and my favorite title of the book, Kink. <laughs> <laughs> She's here to tell us about a fact, some factory, right? Like, I think a it's dark. dark factory. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's dark. Fact. The lights right. went out. It's dark in there. Exactly. So everyone, That's please right. welcome to the show, Kathy Koja. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. And actually, the the title, um, the uh, the name Dark Factory, I found out means a robot factory where the mm-hmm. robots are working 24 seven. So now, why you don't need to turn lights on? They don't need lights. So it's a dark factory. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah nice. See, interesting. The things that you learn while you're researching, right? So, <laughs> so I learned a new thing. So I wanted so, to ask, go ahead. Why I, I have to ask first, so what did you guys uh, get up to last time that you're like still cleaning the mess off the walls? <laughs> it, it, was, it, was just, uh, it, it was just a little uh, Halloween special. Halloween special. We, we've uh, done what, like 14, 15 episodes of this now. And so yeah. we did like a little uh, Halloween special for some friends who supported us so far. They they hopped on with us. And uh, nice. I dressed, uh, my, my daughter did my makeup for me. <laughs> I was like this, this hybrid uh Skeleton, zombie, zombie skeleton. mix, yeah, and, and, and you got slap happy, and it was absolutely hilarious. Things were, <laughs> things got a little crazy with it, and, and like the paint was on me for days. Like, <laughs> I looked like like I look like, like an old rock star because the black paint was on my <laughs> eyelids. You know, you, you could have been Kiss, but yeah. you were yeah. a reject member of Kiss is what you were. Like right. I was, I was like a younger Ozzy Osbourne. Like it was like mascara on my eyes for like a couple of days. So. <laughs> In my eyes too, so yeah, that part's yeah. not as much fun. <laughs> well, I'm I'm glad everybody survived and that yeah. we're able to to come back this week. <laughs> so I, w- I was going to ask to kick off. So the cipher, your debut novel came out in '91, and then you're still currently writing. You know, your new book comes out next year in March or May, right? Is it May? In May, right? So you've been writing for like 30 years or so. So how, for you, in your opinion, how has the not necessarily horror industry, but just the publishing injury industry in general, how has it changed since from when you started to kind of now? I think things, some things are, are very much the same. Um, Mm -hmm. I think readers are still, especially genre readers are still incredibly generous to new voices and want to hear new voices and want to read new things. And what I'm hoping to see, and one of the reasons that I'm doing Dark Factory, the the way that I'm doing it, and with Meerkat Press, who is a very adventurous um, uh-huh. and bold vision press, is to try to see what can we do with the idea of a story since we all, especially since the last plague year, we've all spent so much time online and we've all spent so much time watching things and listening to things and reading things and everything kind of meshes together. So 
what can we do to make that experience to to bring reading into that experience and to bring that experience to reading um i think some of the some of the technologies that we benefit from now that were not available back in the day um, are maybe not being exploited as well as they could be. Um, mm -hmm. You think back to the music industry when like MP3s came out and streaming was first a thing and they just panicked, right? They were like, oh, we have to squash and destroy this because this <laughs> is not how we make money. It's like, uh -huh. but this is the way that people are going to be enjoying and sharing and you know yes things have changed so mm -hmm. let's change with them and i think readers because readers are always adventurous they will change and one of the things that surprises me always is how willing people are to give new ideas a chance but also you you don't have to I ask periodically, I, I will ask folks on social media, um, you know, what is a book to you? What makes a reading experience to you? And some uh -huh. people are super dedicated to the experience on paper. Some people love audiobooks. Some people read ebooks. Some people do all three, depending on, you know, what the, the project is or what the story is. But all those things are just delivery systems, right? For the story. Before we went live tonight, we were talking about the old, old folklore stories. And, uh -huh. you know, way back in the day, there was a worry that, well, if you start writing things down, you know, how will the, the oral tradition won't survive and the stories will cease to grow and they'll stagnate because it's just these words on paper and that's not right. And so it's always been about how do you get the story to the people who want to experience it. And sometimes publishing can be very good at that and sometimes publishing can be not so good at that. So, yeah. and what I'd like to see change is more of it. Uh -huh. you, you hear, you see that argument sometimes where people say audiobooks doesn't really count as reading. But yeah, it does. Cause I'm yeah, still consuming, cause I'm not looking at the words. I'm still consuming the story just through a different format. Absolutely. So you're, you're embracing the change of the technology and, and the advances that we've made as a, as a society because, you know, uh, publishing like in the 90s, you didn't have this kind of format to get the word out. It was up to paper advertising, you know, stuff like that. Now it, there is social media. There's several different ways. Word of mouth because you have goofballs like us talking about, <laughs> you know, these books and spreading the words like that. So you're embracing the technology. But do you see extra challenges kick thrown in there too? I mean, you, you've mentioned a lot of positives, but do you see any new challenges that, you know, is it harder these days to get the word out? Uh, or is it harder to be accepted with, with you know, such a so many more people do oversaturated it almost yeah yeah there's the word oversaturated <laughs> i don't i don't think so and i i think because now more than ever before because we are oversaturated because everything's available to us 24 7 what's most still what's most important is people who will is word of mouth is people who are curating for you it's if your friend if my friend comes to me and says kathy you super need to read this book immediately that's far more important to me than anything mm -hmm. that i might see from a publisher or from especially because right. there's so much stuff because my mm -hmm. friend who i trust or you know a, a curating entity that i trust will go hey look at this this is really cool you should pay attention yeah. to this and that I think is better and easier than ever. I mean, we can share everything like this. Yeah, all instant, yeah. Yeah, and that way the people that you want to be able to, because I've always thought that that my work and, and anyone's work, there are some books that are great and yet I will never have the receptors for them. So I'll never, let's put it this way. I have been to the opera. I appreciate it. <laughs> but that art form is not for me. It just yeah. isn't. I appreciate it on a technical level, on a theatrical level. It's a hell of a lot of work. And oh, yeah. when it's done well, it's an amazing piece of art. But it's not art that I can like. So uh -huh. I'm not going to go to the opera. 
but that said, there are other kinds of art forms that maybe I don't know about. Um, the first time that I went to an immersive performance, um, do you know Sleep No More? That's It's a fairly big commercial immersive performance in New York. It's been there for quite a while now. And it, you go to this, you go to a building and you're experiencing a version of Macbeth, but you're mm -hmm. running through the building and things are happening on all the floors and whatever. And when this was new, uh, it had come, that's a, a British group called Punch Drunk, and they brought a version of it to the States. It was the first time they'd ever done anything in the United States. And a director friend and I went to see that performance. And this was an art form that I had only read about. And I had all the receptors for this thing. It was <laughs> like, what even is this? You can do this? People can do this? It, it took place in this old um, parochial school, a disused parochial school outside of Boston. And the idea was you would come in, but you would be separated out from your friends and uh -huh. everybody would be released at different parts of the building. And you're just supposed to wander around and see what you can see. And the friend with whom I went, we were split up. And we met again at the end of the night after about two and a half hours. And she had seen a completely different show than the show that I saw. She's like, did you see the eel? Like, I didn't see the eel. Did you see the orgy? She's like, I didn't see the orgy. Oh, my God. Where was the orgy? It's like it was in the basement. Where was the eel? It was in the bathtub. Oh, no. Because by the time I went by the bathtub, it was an empty tub filled with, like, black water. And I didn't uh -huh. see it. I, it's like clear something had happened. But. Yeah. Who knows <laughs> Something what crazy happened, <laughs> some crazy happened, but you don't know what it is. And the idea that you could tell a story that way was it's like, OK, this was proof of concept for me. It's like this is what I want to do. Uh -huh. So that's sort of like your whole thing is immersive fiction then. Right. That's sort of your, your tagline for yourself. That's my thing, because I started doing shows after that and making live performances in, mm -hmm. you know, in that kind of spectacular yet very intimate way and the responses to, from the audience because it's not an audience anymore right because people are running around and they're right. they're part of it with you things happened that i could never have foreseen just things that blew my mind ways that people reacted uh -huh. And sometimes it was as small as one person and one of the characters alone in a hallway. And I just happened to see it. And sometimes it was, you know, the whole group would react in really interesting and sometimes unsettling ways. So it was exactly the feeling of watching someone read your work uh -huh. and seeing them react in real time. So it's like, how can you not like that? That is the <laughs> most fun. So I, I'm so happy you keep referring to it as artwork because one of my favorite lines that I use all the time is how writing books, it's an art form, you know, and, and it's always open to interpretation. So to finally hear a writer compare it to art and bring in other art forms into it, it just kind of backs up, <laughs> you know, one, one of my crutches that I, I say a lot in a lot of my reviews, how it's an art form and it's a, open for interpretation for your, your own, for you to take it in yourself. So thank you. And that, that oh, <laughs> no, because that's a responsibility too of us as readers, right? I mean, you have to bring, you're bringing everything that you're about and you're bringing all your receptors to whatever a piece might be. And it doesn't mean you're going to love it, but it means you're going to bring everything to it and try to get out of it whatever you can. And I mean, that's the whole point. Any, any piece of art is supposed to be a conversation. If I'm just writing these books for myself, I don't even need to write them, right? I'm like, wow, what a great story I thought of. Okay, what's for dinner? I mean, the whole point <laughs> is to have that conversation with a reader. And well, well, with that, has there been a book of yours that you do have a certain ideal concept and someone talks to you about it and they interpret it totally different. You're just thinking, no, you miss what I was <laughs> trying to get at or do you just accept it and just go with it? No, I accept it and go with it. Okay. Um, I have had only, in fact, only with my YA novels, I've written seven YA novels and 
there have been actively hostile responses to some of them, but that had nothing to do with the writing and had everything to do with the subject. And so once people get riled up and say, won't someone think of the children, you know, then, <laughs> then all common sense and decency goes out the window. And so that would be, that's the kind of response that I cannot go with. It's like, yeah, no, right. you are, you know, you're laying your own stuff on this story and that doesn't have anything to do with anything I was trying to do. Uh -huh. yeah, but for everything else is fair game. Literally taking your words and twisting them. Is what it sounds like. So. And most of them have never even read the book that they're mad yeah. at, right? They're yeah. just really mad because someone told them something and someone mm -hmm. in their bubble said that something was bad. And, right. you know, we, we all can be guilty of that, but it's your responsibility, especially as a parent, to, you know, see what, if you're concerned about something that your kid is reading or watching or listening to or whatever, then look at it. Oh, yeah. You look at it and That's say, cool, right? <laughs> right. Just look at the damn thing and see what, what the, do you know who Trey Crowder is? Yeah. Uh -uh. Yeah. 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 Trey Crowder has this great routine where he's pretending to be his dad watching Lil Nas X, um, the call <laughs> me by your name video. And he says, this is how my daddy would have handled it. And it's, I won't spoil it for you, but it's this great video of his dad <laughs> watching this and going, well, let's see what's got your great aunt's knickers all in a bunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really, but that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to sit down and watch the thing or listen to the thing or read the thing and then try to understand what is your, where is your child resonating with this? Especially if it flips you out, you know, you should not. I'll tell you the scariest thing I've seen this year was, and I think I tweeted it, um, there's a horrible video. At first I thought it was a joke of this police department teaching you how to search your teenager's room. I watched that. I think I watched it when you tweeted really? it. Yeah. I almost, I couldn't believe it. it's like, here's the proper way. What? You would search your kids and they're saying, well, you know, when they're, if they're a very small child, you know, you probably don't have, what is wrong with you that you distrust your own? Is that the kind of relationship you have with your kids that you're like, you know, the cop of them? And, and they were finding like all the containers with like the, the fake compartments. Right, the right. I know people are going, that's not how I used to hide mine. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, that that is that's a horrible trespass on anybody's privacy. That's the opposite of what you should do, right? But those are, you know, a lot of times those are the why don't we think of the children people and they get all pissed off because something was written that they don't agree with and they want to put a stop to it. So And then that trust between the parent and the kid, it's gone after that. Oh yeah. If you break, if you break it like that. And it should be. I mean, you've proved to them that you can't be trusted. So mm -hmm. Yeah, why should I tell you anything? I'm not going to tell you anything after that. Well, the first horror movie that I saw that really changed my life was um, Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. When I was, and I saw it when it came out. I was a little, little girl. I should not have been seeing it. My sister got in a lot of trouble <laughs> for taking us there. She took us to the drive in, right? And said, if you guys, and she didn't know, she had no idea. And she's like, if you guys act up, we're going to go home. If you're acting silly and screaming. And at the end of the movie, we're all in the front seat. Like some of us are crying, you know, we're like, oh my God. But at the end of that movie, and because I was a kid, the racial text of it went over my head. I didn't understand. Uh -huh. But I see here is this guy who did everything right. He saved as many people as he could save. And without so much as uh, how do you do, he gets shot in the head by a cop, right? right. Yep. And I remember watching that and thinking, okay, don't trust the grownups. <laughs> this, this is not cool. Authority is never going to be your friend. And that was a very valuable lesson for a small person. Isn't it amazing yeah. how that that movie was so far ahead of its time? Oh, you know, it just because, I mean, when people are talking about horror and, and they're talking about horror movies, of course that one is brought up, but it's brought up because of the, the first zombie edge, movie. zombies and all that stuff, yeah. but all of the underlying issues, the racial tension, all that stuff. It, it's hard to find someone to really get that deep into it and talk about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So just the fact that that's just so way before it's time. 
Oh, absolutely. And that was, and I, from what I understand, he, George Romero had originally cast the actor, not because he was African American, but because he was the, he was the guy that he wanted. He was the best guy, but that added this whole other layer of resonance to it that Uh when you watch it now, it's, it's just, and talk about topical, right? Right. I mean, it's like sadly ripped from today's headlines and tomorrow. So Mm -hmm that kind of power was even to a kid that was just undeniable. It's like, okay, that is the subtext in the text. Don't ever trust the authorities to make decisions for you in situations that in situations where they have no grasp of what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. It's like, they just roll in and just start shooting people. Try to save the day when they're not really saving the day. And they have no grasp of what's even happening, right? It's just like uh-huh. we're just going to come in and plow everything under, and yeah, it's it's. But it was a good, it was a very good lesson for a young person. So, <laughs> well, I've got a question here in the comments. Uh, Black Acre mm-hmm. Doe wants to know what book would you recommend to start reading with your work? Well, I think you should start with the cipher always, because. <clears throat> or the the fun hole. <laughs> or the fun hole. The fun hole. Well, the idea. This idea of this bottomless, you know, hole or portal or situation or what's ever going on there, that also has resonance. There's a reason that that book is still popular after all these years. There is something about that situation that really speaks to people and just the the sheer weirdness of it. It's like, here is this thing. We don't know why it's there the smart thing to do would be to leave it alone, right? (laughs) If you do that, it's a really short book, right? right. (laughs) And they close into the dark room. The horror movie's over at that point. Right. If people are like, you know what, fuck it, I'm going home. (laughs) And everybody (laughs) leaves, then the story just ends. But there is something about that mystery that is perennially interesting to people. So I would say start with that. And, or if you don't feel like reading a whole novel, then start with Velocities, which is my latest um, short fiction collection. And that's what I'm reading right now. Velocities. Yes. There's, there's something, there's horror in there. There's fantasy in there. There's just strange stories in there. So (laughs) there's something in there for almost everybody. So what, what would you categorize your work as it's not always just straight up horror it's more just kind of darker fiction would you say that or and i mean that i have written historical fiction i've written ya i i guess everything that i have ever written is pretty much a kathy koja novel and that's as, you, as far as kathy i can koja go genre. right right pretty much your own genre that's that's the kathy koja genre I mean, basically and, like stephen <laughs> king is basically stephen king genre so kathy koja is kathy koja genre. I, and it, it's been really interesting to go across different genres and meet different readers and that goes back to what we were saying before about people being really generous if they like a genre they'll mm-hmm. give you a shot whether or not they've ever heard of you or not um right. my first historical novel was called under the poppy and it was about um dirty puppets in a Victorian brothel, right? (laughs) And these people didn't know me or know any of my other work. And they read it because it was a historical novel and they were interested and they wanted to see, you know, what does this voice have to say to me? So the same thing happened to me in horror fiction. The same thing happened with YA. I, and it's great because it's like going to a bunch of different parties, right? Right. And meeting Uh all the different people there. And well, I know with the, the horror community, I mean, I I can't speak for everyone, but I know I'm accepting uh, people who write other genres may come in and, and give horror a chance. Like Ali C <laughs> <laughs> wrote erotica before writing mm-hmm. horror, you know, but she has two awesome horror books, dark fiction mm-hmm. books that are, are great, you know. And I think, I think that's one thing about the horror community that's, kind of a misconception you know people think the horror community uh, they were mean harsh hardcore you know evil all that stuff we're the nicest people in the world <laughs> you know and we're accepting we want to check out everyone's stuff so i know for the horror and, community we are except outsiders and horror is so vast and, too like everything can be mm, horror in some way and especially now when i think there are 
I hope there are more and more, you know, cross genre pollinations and people don't feel like they only that there is a set of rules for genre. And, and I know that when mm-hmm. people are really when you're really emotionally invested in a genre, there's a part of you that does feel like, OK, well, that really isn't or that really, you know, that really is or that really isn't. And it's kind of hard to keep that kind of fencing out, but I don't think that's how you get the best work. Everybody should feel free to contribute in, and every reader is free to not like it too. I mean, they don't, they don't have to like it. They can throw it across the room or turn it off or whatever. (laughs) They, you know, there's, there's no rules. You can, you can do whatever you want, but that's how you get people to keep a genre alive. You do want different people and you do want new voices and you do want an expansion of the genre and, and anything like in music, you know, you don't want the same things over and over again. You don't want the same 20 people working in whatever genre you might be liking. Right. You want new people. That's how stuff grows. It's also the sort of playoff that is, you know, like uh, our friend of the show, Megan Lucas author, she has a book called songbirds and stray dogs. It's, it's not horror. It's like Southern grit lit kind of stuff, mm. but it has those dark themes and elements that horror fans enjoy. And so it's, she's sort of crossed over and been embraced by the horror community. Also, like uh, Tiffany McDaniel, who wrote Betty, right. sort of blew up this year. Mm-hmm. It's more like a Rust Belt sort of grit. It takes place in Ohio. It's not horror at all, but it has those horror themes and elements in it that horror fans have really been drawn right. to and connected. And then they're branching out into other genres now, not just strictly being pinholed into horror. Right. A lot, lot of horror fans who read a lot of horror, they, they like like David Joy and, and yeah. Donald Ray Pollock and all that stuff's more Southern grit stuff, but mm-hmm. they accept it and enjoy it just as much, so... And if it introduces you to a new voice or to a new, you know, genre, that's great. You just found, yeah. I mean, that's like me running around the, the place in Boston. It's like, wow, this is a thing. Okay, great. <laughs> I, I would like to do more of this, please. What's your favorite genre to write since you do so many different ones? I mean, if, if you had to pick one. <laughs> uh, I mean, there's a reason why you don't know all of them. You apparently like all of them, but right. <laughs> is, I is there one that sticks out the most that, that you really no, because they're all they all have different challenges and they all have different payoffs for me. They're all I have started writing YA almost as a as a fluke. And then I found out what I really loved about it was getting to talk to because my stuff was like upper middle grade high school mm-hmm. age. And I loved mm-hmm. doing school visits and I loved talking to the kids because they were so great and so smart and so funny and they were not going to put up with any nonsense and if they didn't like something they would tell you about it <laughs> and in no uncertain if they were bored you would know it and it was i remember one school visit and i don't remember the book i was there i think it was buddha boy that i was there to talk about and it was this big assembly in like one of those super old school like gymnasium cafeterias where it's so loud you can't hear yourself think. And so they gave me a little lavalier mic and or a hand mic and I was going around talking to the kids. And this one kid was like, hey, 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 hey. So I was like, okay, what what do you have to say? <laughs> he said, he's like, okay, I, I have a question. And I said, all right, you know what? But you're gonna be the very last question. So make <laughs> it a good question. I'm gonna come back to you last. I'm not gonna forget. We have till, you know, 2 30. I won't forget. And I saw the teachers like kind of looking at me, but it's we we're rolling with it. So we did all our, our stuff. And then I came back to this kid at the end and he had everybody's attention. <laughs> and he asked this super great question. And people were like, whoa, dude, your question. And afterwards, one of the teachers said to me, she's like, that kid can be such an asshole. <laughs> you were so lucky. <laughs> But I wasn't lucky and I'm not going to tell her her business and she deals with him every day and she has her own relationship with him. But almost invariably, when I would ask a kid to rise to the occasion, they would rise. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a time ever when I was disappointed where when you really and and it's not about it's again, it's having that conversation it's saying you read that book because you were forced to in school, yeah. but what did you get out of it? You, there's no wrong answer. There's no, you know, you're not going to be graded on this. What, what made it seem true to you? And they would never disappoint. 
and uh-huh. that was what a what a wonderful experience to have and what a what a gift and an honor to have those kind of conversations with young readers and i've been fortunate enough to have some of the kids that i met in through my ya work have become writers themselves oh, cool. and have sent me copies of their books and say you know you inspired me or i remember when you came to talk to us i mean how great is that? What kind That's of That's probably one of the best that? feelings as ah! a creator to be inspiring just to another creator. It's because we're real, we're just all on the same path, right? And we're all trying to do the same thing. And to have someone tell me directly, you were responsible for me doing this. It's like, mm-hmm. so. <laughs> so I like how you said it, it's what you get out of it, what you see in the book, because I'm thinking back in high school, I tried that with a few book reports. <laughs> and I remember my teachers were like, no, that's you missed it. I'm like, I would get so aggravated. You know, I, was, I was still past, but I would like, this is what I got out of whatever it was we were reading. And they're telling you, know? you your opinion's wrong, basically, yeah. is what they're telling you. Basically, that's what it comes down to. And then, it's, and then how does it make you want to do anything? Yeah. I mean, again, I'm not shitting on teachers. They have a horrible job, and it's a hundred times more horrible now. And they're also being squeezed by an administration and by USDT. Right. I mean, you know, they, they, they have to follow and make sure you, you got what they were told that you got. Right. You know? and they're, <laughs> right. It's like insert this book and then you get this literature reaction right. to it. And that's, but yeah, no, that is awful. That's awful because that ruins, it just ruins you for wanting to read on your own. You're like, well, yeah. what fun is that? Right. I don't, like, well, or, even, or even right because you, or even you know, right even worse yeah exactly so i remember between i think it was eighth grade and freshman year our summer homework was to read great expectations by charles dickens and i like could have cared less about reading that big old book over my summer break and that just put me off like i didn't read through middle school or high school like until just a few years ago probably because of that because reading felt like work and it was what they told me to read and i just i didn't care for it it, so right. the school system sort of ruined me on reading for, I don't know, my early teens and 20s and stuff. Yeah. There was a recently, I think it was this past summer, all time is one big blur now, but I think it was this <laughs> past summer in France, they were giving people, young people especially, um, like a cultural gift certificate. And you had X amount of money that you could spend. You had to, everybody got it. And you were... Mm-hmm. We're supposed to spend it on some kind of cultural experience. And a bunch of people got pissed off because the kids bought a bunch of graphic novels. <laughs> well, so what? Yeah. They like it. That's what they want. They did what you asked them to do. They took the money and, you know, they didn't spend it on cigarettes and, and <laughs> you know, whatever. Right. Yeah. They made a cultural choice and now you're pooping on their choice. That's another thing. People say graphic novels and comic books aren't reading either, but it's just another 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 version of storytelling. It's more visual, but it's still storytelling. It's like picture books when you're a kid. Don't tell me those aren't stories, right? (laughs) I mean, come on. A book like Where the Wild Things Are, I don't think that has 100 words in it, and it's an entire world. It's two worlds. It's the world that the little kid comes out of and the world that he goes into. Mm-hmm. How is that not? That, there's more content in there than most novels. I mean, <laughs> but yeah, telling these yeah, kids yeah. you can't spend that—that's not an approved cultural choice. Well, how is that going to make them want to read? Yeah, it's, 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 it's the opposite. Off of reading. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's the opposite. So, author uh, Rob Shepard in the comments seems to know if you have a book that really took you to a place you weren't expecting to go. Oh, I guess he means mm-hmm. while you're writing it, it took you in a different direction. Right. Wow, that's a really good question. Um, I would have to say Dark Factory because when I started working on it, I had an expectation of how the story was going to unfold that was 100% wrong, maybe (laughs) 150% wrong. It was wrong. And I kept struggling with it, even though I should know better by now. But I kept struggling with this text and thinking, why is this, you know, what's stopping me? What is, what's holding me back? And then I realized you're trying to do this in like a traditional novel format and it, it's not going to work that way. So Uh you have to figure out what does it want to do and then go that way. But it took me a good year 
to really get on track with it. And I didn't know what was wrong. And fortunately, I'm a persistent <laughs> writer and so you, stubborn. So you had to adapt to your own idea and mm -hmm. make yourself fit into what you wanted to do. And to, to fit in what it was trying to do, to fit uh -huh. in with what the story wanted to do and not be about what do I think is good or what did I think I had in mind because that was clearly wrong. And uh -huh. I'd still be at it, right? <laughs> I'd still be sitting here going, no, I can't be on a podcast. I have to finish this book. <laughs> it's on page 30, but I'm going to finish it. But until I could let go of what I thought I was doing and do what I was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Then so you sort of had to get some preconceived right. notions of what it was going to be. And you had to completely throw that out the window. So, so where did everything come from? You said it took you a good year to kind of really get on track. To crack it. Yeah. So where did all the inspiration come from for this? Yeah, uh, you have to be released book that we're excited for because it sounds like it's different. It sounds like <laughs> something I've never yeah experienced it's, before. It's fun, and that was it's it's very interesting. Just I had a very similar experience, in fact, with the cipher. Um, mm -hmm. When I started to write, I had written a story called um, "Distances," a science fiction story that got a lot of traction and a lot of attention and my agent at the time said well why don't you try to turn this into a novel see if you can can do a novel and i started writing it and it was the same thing i kept hitting this something was wrong i and now i would know better you would think i would know better <laughs> but i thought all right well this is not working but there was one character in that kind of revised or expanded story that I sort of was interested in and said, well, here's this guy, Nicholas, and he's like trying to write poetry and he seems to be having all these problems. What's his deal? And once I pulled him out of that failing novel, all of a sudden the whole fun hole thing, everything just took off. It's like, oh, that's what that was supposed to be about. Oh, okay. So the same thing happened with Dark Factory. I had been writing, um, kind of a, a horror novel ghost story in some ways that was set in Berlin, in contemporary Berlin. And the people in it were so awful that there was a lot of cruelty, emotional cruelty going on in this book. And I was having a horrible time working on it. And I complained to my agent and said, this book isn't working. And he said, well, why don't you like stop writing it? If it's not working, maybe that's, maybe that's your clue. So I put it aside, but there was one character in the story that I really liked. And I said, I'm going to take him out and see what happens. And he turned out to be the cornerstone of Dark Factory. He's Ari. He's, he's the main guy of Dark Factory. And so it was interesting to have that analogous experience on two, you know, two ends of, of my writing journey, but the same thing. So clearly I don't learn. <laughs> you must be doing certain. something right though since you've been doing great stuff for so long <laughs> I, I, saw, I saw the like the swag bag there everything that's oh, yeah. coming out with this uh, press pass and all that stuff it's pretty cool Who, whose idea was that to come up with like all that swag to all the, all the goodies of, yeah all the goodies well trisha reeks who is the genius of meerkat press and when she i talked with her about doing this book and we decided okay, we don't want to, we're not going to do it in a, a it, it, it's not traditionally written, so it's not going to be traditionally published. Uh -huh. And we thought, what is the best way to get people involved? And that's why we started, we started the darkfactory.club site where uh -huh. there's new content every day. The characters are always posting on the site every day, one of the three, and then I post too. And as a way to start the story and get people to know the characters, to start seeing what the club is about. And so we thought, well, when, when we have the, the pre-order package and we want people to be involved in the world, well, what are we going to, what do we want in there? Well, what do you get at a club? You know, you yeah. get, you get a VIP pass and you get coasters and you, get, stickers and you get the mask <laughs> and stickers and all this other stuff and the book and there's paper dolls. I mean, we just couldn't stop. We just kept putting in more stuff. But the idea was to make it fun, to be like uh -huh. a fun 
experience for i mean we did there were some things we wanted to do that we weren't able to do we wanted to fun back into horror (laughs) we are well if you're not and if you're not having fun that's why this giant sign behind my head if you can see (laughs) that's fun because i learned that as well with doing um live performances live shows when we would the folks that i was creating with the artists and, and dancers and performers we'd be in rehearsal and if we stopped having fun it's not that we're not working hard we're working very hard but if it stopped being fun it's like okay something's wrong let's stop let's go back to where when things were feeling good and we were having fun and creating and let's go from there because we've taken a wrong turn let's mm-hmm. let's don't do that anymore and that if I have any religion, that's it. Fun is it. Because when you're really having fun and you're playing and you're creating, you're very alive and you're feeling things start happening among groups. Things start happening on things you're working on. When you're in that flow and that fun state, that's pretty optimal. Yeah. I'm gonna start Charlie's using got a fun question here. Religion. Sort of relates to Dark Factory. Do skin and kink relate to Dark Factory at all or is it completely separate? They don't, Charlie, and Charlie has a, a, a working knowledge of Dark Factory as well. Charlie <laughs> has been has been backstage uh, at, at the factory. Um, skin, and Skin, for, for folks who might not know the book, um, is the story of a performance troupe that, uh, based on um, sculpture and on, da-da, there you go sculpture and and dance then they start putting on these very kind of baroque and dangerous performances um it was influenced by mark pauline's survival research labs in mm-hmm. in the 90s which were i never saw one of his performances live but they were extremely uh they're very dangerous and and Mark <laughs> Pauline himself got injured, and I mean it was it was a big deal. People, once or twice, people died, and oh, wow. so I mean like legit dangerous. Yeah. And the idea was that you would push a performance as far as it could go with mm-hmm. machines that probably should not, machines that had not been ha, were not um, underwear under writer labs <laughs> certified. But that was a, that was a story of skin is what happens when you take a performing mode too far and mm-hmm. they definitely lost the fun. They had oh, yeah. gone way past where the fun was. Kink has kink has nothing to do with Dark Factory. Kink probably has more to do with the book that didn't get written before Dark Factory because kink is also about um, emotional warfare. Let's say it's a it's a love triangle that doesn't necessarily go horribly wrong as it was horribly wrong to start with. And Uh it's it's really emotional warfare, emotional terrorism, Um, very dark book. And that's why I've always thought of it as one of my horror novels, for sure, because it isn't you don't there's no blood, there's no visible blood but there's uh-huh. lots of pain so but yes be we, horrific without being gory and bloody and stuff right yeah and yeah and it's very in the in the movie um pan's labyrinth the which is a film that i think is just so perfect i love that movie and to me the scariest part of all was when uh the the colonel is questioning the man who stutters and is being so incredibly cruel to this guy mm-hmm. and that cruelty is harder to watch than a million you know splattery bloody it's just so difficult to watch and to look at because that's because human cruelty is really ugly right. I was, I was gonna say, pe- people yeah. are really horrific at times so that's <laughs> that's the real horror in the world the people. it is and that, that a, a lot so i say that a lot that humans are the true monster they're scarier than any dracula oh, werewolf you know any kind of made-up monster humans are the scariest monsters of all by far although once a friend told me that werewolves could climb trees and that really freaked me out <laughs> I'm like you're a liar they can't find these he's like think about it kathy they're half human 
shut up. <laughs> <laughs> shut up. No, they're not. So that's but, the next novel coming out at Dark Factory. The, the I know, werewolf, right? The Conny, werewolf right? and the trees, right? The werewolves <laughs> are in the trees again. Oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going out. No, no. But yeah, that that's an invigorating kind of fear. That, But yeah, the human human fears are much, much worse. So... But I am. I'm. I'll, I'm glad when people who have read horror fiction of mine will look at Kink because Kink was pretty much marketed and sold as like contemporary fiction, whatever that is. So literary uh, fiction, whatever. But as we pointed out, all fiction is literary. So. So uh, our friend Crystal wants to know if if you went to art school because you really nailed some of the types of folks that you find in art school during Cipher. It brought me back to her art school days in the nineties. No, I didn't, but I know a lot of people who did. You said and before used, we started that you weren't very artistic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew a lot of people like that. And I went to a lot of those galleries and mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, I did my time. I did my time at those galleries. <laughs> and, and I think that one of the things that I liked about, people's reactions to Cypher and to Skin, too, in this regard. Everyone who had read it was sure that they knew where it was set. And mm -hmm. I never specifically say a site because I don't need to. Everybody has, you can, you can do that yourself. You know where it is. If you have a resonance with it, you'll know where it is because you, that comes out of your experience, right? Uh -huh. And what you... It's like saying, uh, you know, in the in the dark forest, you don't need them to tell you where the dark forest is. You know where the dark forest is. You've been to that dark forest, so you can do. I think readers are so skillful at making the world with you that uh -huh. you really don't need to give people more than they need to start creating the story themselves. And it, you know, that was one of the big reasons too for Dark Factory is to ask for people's engagement. Like right now we're doing the mask contest. We're asking people to make a mask. They can use the template, which mm -hmm. now Brad has and I have. We have not built them yet, but we are going to. <laughs> or you can just make your own mask as long as it has antlers. That's that's uh -huh. all you have to do. But the idea that readers have already been doing that. Readers are creating the world right along with you when they're reading your work. So we just wanted to nudge it one little step further and ask people if they want to, to become more engaged in it. But you don't have to tell people things. They will do it. They know. They know. You, and that's the satisfaction of reading, right? Because if the author is so hyper detailed, they explain everything. It really takes away from the reader's imagination. Like there's nothing left for them to incorporate to the story, to add to the story in their own head. Right. There's nothing to do. Right. It's yeah. like someone spoon feeding you and you go, that's yeah. why some. Oh, like the, that's just more sane. Yeah. And the same way that sometimes we get pissed off when we see films and go, oh, that's not how I imagine that character. Yeah. Because yeah. you did have a, you had cast that person in your head already. You knew right. exactly what they looked like. Or you're so, like, I would have written it like this or I would have done this or. Yeah. Because you've already made <laughs> that whole story in your own mind. So, yep. yeah. Why would you why would you not want readers to do that or why would you you know try to get between that? That's the fun of it. And for, readers for are smarter than some authors give them credit for. Like some people just have to explain it so much, but readers can figure it out. And people know too when they're I mean the same way and we have all had this experience of sitting in the movie theater where someone behind you is going, Who's that guy? What are they doing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I just want to apologize everybody about that. <laughs> it's you, okay. That's Jay. I kind of have a hearing issue, so I'm like. <laughs> no, but you know what I mean when people are like saying, "Well, they're." It's like they're not. The director isn't trying to hide anything from you, right? The writer's not trying to hide anything from you. Just go with it, and you have all the tools you need already to figure it out. You know yeah. exactly what. You can you can make your version of this movie or your version of this book while you're watching it. So yeah, you definitely want to leave as much creative space as possible for people to to bring that. I mean, why wouldn't you want them to do it? That's like when you get the big info dump that just explains everything. It just it takes you, it breaks the pacing of the story. It takes you out of it. Yeah, puts you to sleep. <laughs> 
It's like, and then you start flipping ahead, right? That's why I just finished reading Dune because I had never read it. I'd never seen any of the films until this uh -huh. film. And I saw this film, blew me away. And I said, I got to go back because I, yeah. I know there are things that I'm not, not that I'm missing, but I want to know more about the politics. I want to know more about, you know, the Bene Gesserit. I, I just want more. And yeah. being able to, and that's what, I mean, being able to read it while I had the soundtrack blasting, that was really fun, okay? That was a great way to experience the story. And I had some of his images in my mind, and I had my own images, and what would I, who would I cast, or what do I think it would look like? But there was just enough in the film, and, enough, and the book is not super, I mean, for as much as he gets done, in this book, which is not that big, this guy is wasting no time. He's like, these things are happening and you're just supposed to figure it out and keep up. It's like, oh, I don't know what a Bene Gesserit is, but I see this lady who's wearing this hat and she's kind of like a priest and I yeah. kind of know what a priest is, so I can go with that. And it's like some weird ritual. All right, I've seen weird rituals. <laughs> I can go with that. So I didn't have to know everything. I wanted to know more later, but I was, I was fine. I was able to figure it out, and that's exciting. That's fun. To sort of go off that, do you prefer to watch the movie before the book or read the book first? Because if you read, watch the movie first, you have those preconceived visual images of what these characters look like, what they sound like, instead of the other way around, where you can sort of imagine it yourself and then go into the movie. Do you carry either way, or I don't know. That's a good question. I'm trying to think. Just kind of depend on what it is, maybe. It does depend. I'm a big fan of Wuthering Heights. That's probably my favorite book ever. I read it for the first time when I was 10, and I have uh -huh. loved it all my life. And I have never seen a good film version of, <laughs> ever. There has not one been made. There was Andrea Arnold did a, a, a version that had, I thought was the best depiction of the setting I had ever seen, but no one has nailed that movie yet. So I, I wait with interest before, before <laughs> I die. I hope somebody does it because that is a great, great, great book. And that I have argued for that to be included in, in people who like horror novels and people who like ghost stories. That book is so fucking punk and so <laughs> crazy pants. All the good people wind up dead. I mean, it's, it's so lawless and they accept from the very, I mean, the, the story opens with this, this ghost tormenting like our viewpoint character and saying, let me in, let me in. I've been on the Moors for 20 years. Let me in. And he's like, I quoted this on, on one of my socials, uh, the line is terror made me cruel. And when the little ghost is trying to reach her hand in the window, she he takes her wrist and rubs it against the broken glass. He's like <laughs> trying to cut a child's wrist, okay? This is pretty hardcore. And everybody in the book accepts that ghosts are real, that the mm -hmm. supernatural is a thing, that it, it's so, it, it's one of the most uncompromising books that I have ever read, and I will love it till I die. And But that could very could very easily be argued as, it's certainly extreme enough to be a horror novel, uh -huh. and it's certainly you know dark enough. And especially all kinds for of, that was written too. Oh yeah, she was such a badass. She's like, I'm <laughs> doing this. And people are like, Wait, what? <laughs> you know, no, 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 no. You have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> so, author Hamlin Bird has the question. Uh, he just finished reading paperbacks from hell and noticed Grady Hendrix thanked you in the acknowledgments. Did you? Can you tell us about what your contributions were with that? I think Grady just really likes my work. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm serious. I'm serious. I think that he just really, really, I met him a few times and we've had dinner and stuff and he's super cool. And I thought uh -huh. that was, he, I saw him do a presentation of paperbacks from hell um, at a club in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And it was so beautifully done. Was that, a, was that like a sports ball thing? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm unaffiliated. Oh, okay. All right. Sports balls. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm unaffiliated with all sports balls. So, right. Go team, whatever. Go sports. But he was, he was, he did this super cool presentation with slides and old book covers and 
we got to meet and chat afterwards. And I know that he is a is a, a admirer of my work, and so that's where that thank you comes from. He seems to really have brought uh, just not notoriety is not the right word, but recognition to some of these older books that maybe have just fallen by the wayside and you couldn't even find anymore. And then was it right. Valancourt books is putting them all back out again. Right. Right. And that, and though a lot of those books too, that, and that was one of the problems of publishing. And I think it's exponential now too, taking us back to the, to where we started. There is so much product out there now that mm -hmm really good things might never be read because there's just yeah. too damn much stuff. And it the is, same yeah. my, my TBRs are like lifetimes. <sighs> Don't even want to talk about it. I'll never finish all the books. I, I know. And they're good books too. It's not that oh, yeah. you don't want to read them. You're like, but you, then new things come. I'm in a day. I mean, yeah. You, you, right. have so many, you have so many new ones that are trying to make it, but then you have the ones like yourself and like, like Ronald Kelly who mm -hmm. released things in the nineties and yeah, are now and and the, yeah and now are still in the mix of everything and you're like okay well i gotta check this out because it's new from you know someone i read in the 90s you know so right yeah. and it's new to you if you yeah. haven't read it before it's like finding you know stumbling over music online or something going wow what is that and you find out wow these people have been doing this for like 20 years i never yeah. heard of them they're new to me so right. i'm excited i want to i mean how long ago did dune come out for god's oh. sakes it's saying it's like 40 <laughs> years old right but it's clearly got power yeah. and it's the story is still holds up and will continue to hold up. Cause we got to uh, talk with Ronald Kelly on another show and he talked about, you know, when zebra would put his books out, they'd be on the shelves for like maybe a month and then they would just disappear. Yeah. You couldn't find them gone. anywhere else again. They're gone forever. And so he was like really excited. People were rediscovering, uh, was it fear? Is that what it's called? Jay? Fear is the big one. Yeah. You know, like, like what, 30 years later. And it's just, he sort of talked about it really revitalized him as an author. Like he sort of maybe thought about just giving up because people weren't sure. really reading stuff. And mine, mine is a zebra one. But not a, yeah. And people it. started reading it recently and reviewing it and just sort of blowing his name up again. And it's really revitalized him and put the, the spark back in him wanting to write more stuff. And I think he says he's got like, I don't remember the number, like 10 or 11 books like coming out between the next two years or something crazy like that. Good. I mean, right. And it, because he wants to have that conversation, right? I mean, we're yeah. not writing them for ourselves. What's the point? If you're, you want to, and to have, I mean, think of it, think of the amount of effort that goes into writing this novel and then it's on the shelf for less than a month and then right. it's stripped and gone. gone. Did you kind of have the same uh, experience with like Del Abyss with your earlier stuff? Like it was there and then it was just disappeared? No. It was no. there. It was there. Okay. <laughs> I, well, no, but I was I was fortunate to get a push and to have a mm -hmm. publisher that was willing to. Yeah. But, you know, does that mean like I'm special? No, it means that these this was a book that they had decided they wanted to put uh -huh. push behind. And after a certain level of competency, it could be anybody's book. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like it's not like you're the special good right <laughs> After a certain level of competency, it could have been anybody. And uh -huh. but they decided for whatever reasons they wanted. And that happens now. Fortunately, most of the time they are really good books. But sometimes, and we have all had that experience, people are like, oh, you should read this. And you read this and go, well, that was ass. That yeah. book is, <laughs> I mean, I've been hearing about, oh, you really need to. The last one that I remember that I can talk shit on was... <laughs> years ago um a book called the lovely bones and okay, i think i remember people remember the I lovely bones i know that and people were all about this shit oh you gotta read the lovely bones you gotta didn't they the make bones. didn't they make that into a movie did i think so did Peter hard, Jackson so a movie? It, yeah and you and i that i don't i uh, stayed away but that <laughs> book was not a good book that was not a book where and that was straight up it's that you could very easily categorize it as a horror novel because it's this dead girl telling the story of how she became a dead girl right yeah but for some reason that was the book that got this giant push and da 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 da, da and everybody for a while was reading it and a friend <laughs> whose taste i thought i respected oh yeah one, one. <laughs> Juan must not like Lovely Bones either. <laughs> it was not good. And my friend who I thought had good taste was like, oh, Kathy, you have to read this. And it's like this. Uh, like, They're not your friends now, right? <laughs> for different reasons. But yeah, that's like, 
that's not good. It isn't just I don't like it, but it doesn't deserve all this, you know, hype and blow up. And it didn't. Was it competently written in English? It was. But it, <laughs> did it deserve like a big hoop de doo? No. But that was something that they decided they were going to push for whatever reason, and it got the big push. And yeah. but sometimes books that get the big push are really good. So yeah. you know, caveat emptor, you're you're on your no, own. I'm Next summer, we'll see Lovely Bones Part 2 come out. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? The <laughs> bones are back. Like, uh, <laughs> that's what kills me about like James Patterson. And not to, to crap on him, because I haven't uh, really read his stuff. But go he's ahead, so... Bro, bro. He's, go I've ahead. Only, I've only read like one of his books. I've only read the first that's one, one Walking a Spider. But <laughs> like, he's so huge, and it just seems like, from what I've heard, it's just so basic. But there's all these fantastic like Indian small press ho- authors yeah, they just write amazing stuff, and then they're, they're just blasting James Patterson out there for everybody to read. Like yeah. he comes out with a new book like once a day. It's he doesn't, even, <laughs> he doesn't even write them anymore. If you look, it has his name, and then has the person who wrote it. Under right, it. he said in the video like he has so many ideas, he doesn't have time to write them. So he gives someone the idea, like the skeleton, and then they write it and puts his name on there. It's I just, have so much money to count. I don't have there. I don't have yeah. hours in the day, right? <laughs> and there, there's nothing wrong with. Uh, like that's a crap. Isn't... Like if you like James Patterson, that's great. But there's so many. <laughs> Look at you backtrack more, now. Look there's you. so many more talented authors. There are better that, things that to could read. Be right? out there. Yes, he's over there like are... lighting cigars with hundred dollar bills. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like... <laughs> and that's fine. There, you, there's nothing wrong with having success in your creative endeavor. That's great. That's what we would all like. But it's yeah, and it is that it's in music, it's in movies. It's like here's this thing that we all have to like. And sometimes it's really good. I mean, Dune has certainly been in your face for the last month where you can't get away from it, but it happens yeah. to be really great. So, okay, we got lucky. But there are also, there are plenty of movies where you're like, that's awful. Or, you like know, a, no, what was it? Malignant. It. Is it Malignant? Just Malignant by James yeah. Moore. Like, I didn't, I did not like that. Everybody loved that one. I didn't, I didn't care for that one too much. I, 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 I'm the one, I think I was the first one to say this sucked. Yeah. That was yeah, I didn't, worst movie ever. Watch I it. think the trailer did it a disservice because the trailer made it seem like it was going to be super serious and stuff, and it was like more like almost slapstick, it like Evil Dead style. Yeah, I and it, it really just cool. completely yeah. threw me off. And when you're, <laughs> that's the that's and sometimes trailers can be so bad the, though, right? The, like, the trailer was yeah. bad for that one because it did not capture the the vibe and essence of what that movie truly was. The movie didn't find the right. right. That's, what the <laughs> That's movie a good was. quote. Yeah. <laughs> no, it is. There's a the what is it? The trailer for there's a new version of Macbeth coming out in January with Denzel oh, that Washington. One? Denzel. That looks pretty yeah, good. Yeah, that looks awesome. And that trailer is so it's all black and white too, right? Spare. And it looks like yeah. like the super old studio movies like from the thirties, right? Where they're clearly on a sound stage. You know, it just uh-huh. looks really atmospheric and dark but they that trailer is like you get just enough and you know you know the story everybody knows Macbeth, whatever anyway yeah. but it it makes you want to see it instead of telling you like literally everything where you're like well i didn't need to watch that movie <laughs> well i'm done okay yeah. next your two and a half minute trailer tells you all the spoilers and yeah. we're good <laughs> right you're like well we're we're done all right where do you want to go eat that's <laughs> usually how it is with comedy movies lately all the funny parts are in a two minute trailer you get and you go yeah. you watch it you're like well nothing right. else is funny you know that was you it, it, it yeah it's, it's, that was it's it com- okay. comedy genius or something and it's like no you got two minutes of it total like with and, halloween kills they showed a lot of the good kills in the trailer and it ruined them for the movie and sometimes the the plot twist in movies that's why book trailers thankfully I should avoid all spoilers and should avoid, they should only be atmospheric <laughs> yeah. and not tell anybody anything. The, I am happy to, to boast that the audio track for the cover reveal for Dark mm-hmm. Factory was created by Josh Mallerman and Chad yeah. Stocker in their, nice. wearing their high strung hats. And, and we <laughs> had fun. We had a lot of fun that day. We were recording and, Chad was doing strange things and Josh was producing and it was a lot of fun. It was fun. I was going to ask was, you about that because they did the, uh, the whole Carpenter's farm soundtrack to his book that he wrote. Online. Right. So are they doing more music for dark factor? Or was it just for the trailer? 
so far it is just for the trailer because we wanted to do it was in fact when right before the plague um velocities came out that spring and chad stocker and i were doing another we were going to do an event a launch event and chad mm -hmm. was going to play live and i was going to read and another artist rachel harbert was going to do some movement art and unfortunately all that you know got destroyed by the plague but it yeah. was we had some great rehearsals it would have been really cool we'll have to do it again if we can ever like all get together again have you done so, as much publicity for any other book because this is like you're doing a lot now for dark factory i mean is this something you normally do whenever you release a book or i feel like it's another <laughs> level than any other book and, it, really. yeah. and it is because it's it's more than just the promo stuff I mean, we do, we have the, you know, we did the trailer and we did the, the cover reveal and stuff, but because the actual story is already on the site, I'm still, I'm writing stuff for it every day because the posts are going up every day, every day, every day. And that's really bringing you into the story. So if I was, if I thought of that as all strictly promo, it would be hard to do, but it's not because it's the story and and it's fun. And the what is starting to happen now is one of the characters, Marfa Carpenter, is a journalist, and she's starting to interview people in the real world. And I just got another interview subject sent me her answers today. And Ari, one of the other characters, got interviewed by a real person. So we're really kind of meshing. So it, it's immersive. Yeah. It's <laughs> And some of the people are actual people that you can know, and some of them are characters. And yeah. so it's it's that part is a lot of fun. Yeah, it seems like all all that stuff leading up to the actual release is the fun, more important part of it. And oh, by the way, when that day comes around, here's the book that we've talked about for so long. But it is so much everything. Fun about. No, but everything that's on the site is made for the site. Right. So, mm -hmm. except for the quote bot stuff, we have actual quotes pulled from the book that's quote bot stuff. But everything that's there won't be anywhere else. And two, if you don't, if someone doesn't want to look at all that stuff, or they're like, Jesus Christ, that's more than I want to deal with. <laughs> they don't have to deal with it. They can straight up read just the print book and ignore everything else and they will still get a full novel experience. It's like so two stories of one. It <laughs> is, it is. And and one of the reasons we did it that way was because I did a lot of research beforehand on how, when I was still trying to figure out how are we gonna make this a book and I was still thinking in terms of a print, you know, print only book. And I read a lot of books with creative, typesetting and you know interesting presentations but some of most of them all of them okay if i'm being honest every single one of them was so difficult like you could do it some yeah. of them i couldn't even finish because it, the reading experience was so difficult one of them in particular um there's a designer steven sagmeister and he wrote a book um, about his own graphic design career called Made You Look. And he's done really interesting graphic work. So I, I was geeked to see this book. But one of the choices they made was have some of the type, the font they used was his own handwriting. And this guy can't write. And so <laughs> it was really, I mean, I wouldn't want him to use my handwriting. You know what I mean? But it was oh, extremely yeah. I've difficult. I've got chicken scratch. <laughs> Think of this whole whole sidebars of it written in your handwriting, and then think of people trying to force their way through those. It would be illegible if it was in my handwriting. It yeah, wasn't. It, it, it starts, starts out fine, but after a while, I get tired tired of writing. It just like lines and stuff. Like I'm just so used to typing. It just yeah. I'm just sloppy if I handwrite anything. No, and that, so that was like their design choice was to have it in his handwriting, but you couldn't read it, and so. Mm -hmm. I wanted it to make sure that it was something that if people didn't, if they only wanted to engage and just get the narrative, just get the book, that they could have that. But if you want more, there's a lot more. Yeah. But uh, again, it's your choice and how much you want to engage. So the, the content on the site, is that 
going on at the same time as the events in the novel or is it before the event like a prequel kind of stuff or it's mostly prequel the interviews the marfa interviews get closer as it gets closer and closer to the launch of the novel they get closer and closer so they so it's like the dark factor is going on now and then when the book comes out when that part of the story continues right like that okay right and the because the idea is that it's this dark factory is this club that you know people are Uh going to and having fun and then something happens there that changes it changes everything but it does it changes everything (laughs) But yeah, so, but if you never want to look at that, you're good. If you do want to look at it, if you want to make masks, if you want to do all kinds of stuff, we're going to have a lot more fun things to do for people who want to engage. Mm-hmm. And so is there, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, when, when I, I did my immersive shows, we tried to operate on the same principle. That's like, if all you want to do is come here and stand in the corner and watch this, it should still be enjoyable to you, right? You should still be able to get something out of it. But if you want to engage with the performers, if you want to do, you know, some of the things that we have for you to do, then you can do that. Uh-huh. And we have have fun that way. Are these shows recorded anywhere? Or mm-hmm. yeah, just only in person? Okay. Because there is no good way. Right. To, to really get the That's whole not like- real feel of it. But I was just, you know. I no, know, I know. Somebody, I know somebody brought in like a little phone just to post But it on even YouTube. then, yeah. even then, you're that person is curating for you, yeah. right? Yeah. Because, because, because what you're seeing what they're, do, what they're, yeah. You see what they wanted to see. And if a bunch of other stuff is happening, like so my friend and I saw the two different where, shows, right? Where do you have to go for one of these then? Well, you can't, you can't <laughs> go anywhere now because of the plague. Of, so, of course. yeah, yeah, of course. But. Well, that's one of the things that I want Dark Factory to be able to do is kind of open up that experience. We're going to do the launch, the book launch at a uh, music studio in Atlanta and get people involved that way. I was going to ask if if Dark Factory was actually going to be a physical club people could go to for like the immersive experience for at least a short period of time. There, Well, nothing is off the table. And actually, we are thinking of... Um, involving VR and AR experience so people can because one of the things it is I think that the that COVID has given us as kind of a of a gift is that everyone is so much more comfortable using Zoom, being able to go online. There no one's wigged out by it anymore. Yeah. And that way they're able to do things and experience things that they couldn't otherwise. I mean, we're all talking right now and we're not in the same place, but we yeah. are in the same place. So, and we're sharing the same experience. So I'm hoping that we can make that available to people in ways that are fun for them. And we're still trying to figure out how that can happen. So, cause this is also a work in progress too, which is really cool. And yeah, who knows what will happen. So I wanted to talk about nerve. It sort of ties into the immersive stuff with nerve. I like you had a quote uh, that sort of the uh, the tagline for Nerve was go deep, go dark, go nerve. But the darkness wasn't necessarily like a bad thing or like a scary thing, just like an unexplored part. I really like how you describe that. And that was the feeling that we were always going for, um, that you weren't sure what was going to happen, like the darkness of not being 100% sure what would happen mm-hmm. and what what you could bring out of that or what you could bring to it. And at one of the, at one of the, the performances, I did a version of Alice in Wonderland. And during the, it was set in a little, um, this funky little preschool building, a parochial school preschool. (laughs) And we brought people in through one door and ran them all through the building and up and down stairs. Like they were following the white rabbit and stuff and everything was all fun and games. And the red queen was very murderous in in our version. (laughs) Like she is in, you know, off with her head and all that stuff. But she at one point killed one of the, the a very inoffensive and friendly character that everybody liked Uh and as when we were rehearsing this the two performers who are have worked together on on many 
many projects and they they know each other very well and they work together very well and so when one of them was like gonna when the red queen is gonna strangle this little tweedledee and marianne the tweedle said i want her to throw me on the floor kathy i want her to throw me on the floor i'm like marianne we can't do that because you're going to be dead for the at least a half an hour you're going to have to be still and if you're on the floor people could step on you i mean it's dark you know it's dim in here and that's not safe we can't do it that way okay so there was this kind of crappy couch that we dragged out in the hallway and we said, okay, well, kill her, kill her and throw her on the couch. Okay. <laughs> at, least, at least she'll be comfortable. <laughs> right. And so she, and so she can lie still and right and be comfortable and also not be stepped on. So this, the scene happens. And at first people are like, wait, what? Because the Tweedle <laughs> has been in our version, the Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the Tweedle was alone. The other, the other twin had been killed or spirited away or something. So, our Tweedle was just like in her room and inviting people in and giving them candy and painting their nails and like trying to play with them and stuff. And she was this adorable little inoffensive character. And so when the Red Queen finally goes in that room, people were like, it's yeah, <laughs> going to happen. And she just straight up chokes her out and throws her on the couch. This is, this is psychedelic. People, <laughs> people were like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I can't believe this happened. And so as the, as the story moved on to another room, and this is why I could never have predicted this in a billion years. I mean, here is this Tweedo lying down on this, this <laughs> sofa. And as people walked past, they treated it exactly the way they would in a funeral home. <laughs> they touched her hand. They stopped and paused and looked down at her. It made all the hair on the back of our neck stand up. It's like, oh, my God. She, yeah. she was really dead to them. And they had felt something for her and they wanted to pay their, respects. pay their respects, right? It was crazy pants. And and there were other parts in that show where people would try to get between the characters and like protect them. <laughs> Don't kill and anybody say, else. <laughs> right, leave him alone. And it's like, wow, okay, I'm glad that you're into it. But on the other hand, this is something that they've rehearsed and you can't get yeah. between them or somebody will get hurt. I mean you know what I mean? It's like you're throwing oh, yeah. them off and they might injure themselves, not you, but they could injure themselves. And so I would have to like kind of go in there and go, <laughs> you, this is Wonderland. You know, you can't change what happens here. So you have to, you know, back off. But so the, these shows are they, shows? I was going to, yeah, answer his question first. <laughs> <laughs> how long are the shows? Well, how long are the shows? It depend on what we were doing between usually about an hour, uh, which is a long time for people to pay that kind of attention. Right. Because uh -huh. just a little bit, you told us I'm wore out now. Just <laughs> right. I know. Yeah. I mean, Think it's of like, like I'm picturing right? like one big acid trip in my head. You know, it's really psychedelic. And I'm, I'm sweating just from listening to what you said. So. <laughs> it was intense. <laughs> and sometimes at almost every show, there would be people who would either disengage at some shows. We would have walkouts. People yeah. would just, you know, they, had, for they were, or they didn't, they didn't like what we were doing or it was too weird or whatever. So not they the kind of know. art, <laughs> not, not the kind of, which is perfectly fine. And also no refunds. Yeah. So <laughs> you get the money in the door. It's all yeah. I know. Right. Well, and we also made that very plain to people and said, look, this isn't like a show that you sit and watch. This is a show that we are all creating together now when you come in. So if you leave, I mean, you can leave, you're not a hostage, you can leave, but you can't come back in because, and you can't come late either. And yeah. a couple of times we did lock people out and people got pissed off. It's like, I'm sorry. I told you that 10,000 times when you buy your ticket on the site, everything for that reason, the doors open at X time and they close at this time. If you're not yeah. there, too bad for you because we've started making this thing together and we can't have you coming in late and, you know, disrupting shit. It's too late. It's like it someone just... opening the movie theater door and all, it's all bright now. You can't I know. see. And... <laughs> and everyone turns around like, yeah, jerk. <laughs> right. <laughs> so are these, are these like one-off shows? Like Alice in Wonderland is just that one time or is it like 
you do it a couple nights in a row or something, or is it just that one? It event depended. Oh, wow. Some of them, the very last one that we did was called Glitter King, and it was in a, a gallery space, a very cool old gallery space. It used to be a bank, and mm -hmm. a very cool guy had bought the space and was rehabbing it. And that one was a one night. We did that one night. The idea was you were going to a club in 1980s Berlin ish kind of club like a dance club and mm -hmm. there was an insulting uh, bouncer at the door that was me and <laughs> it was really fun because my friends would come up and go hi kathy and i'm like hi <laughs> who are you what's your name you know to try to say you know come on we're now we're playing this game this is what we're playing yeah. and to keep making that feeling of you're in this space where now we're in a totally different space. We're in a space where anything could happen. And mm -hmm. that one was super intense. It was based on um, Christopher Marlowe's play, Edward II. And it's this king who has recalled his lover from exile, but his wife is also there and his wife is like not down with this. <laughs> and so there's all this tension when you come in and plus it's a really loud club. And we had uh, a wonderful, um, musician played our dj and a, a musician and producer played our dj and so he's playing you know he's playing dance music and people are dancing and it's like in any club when you see people like are they fighting like what's going on over there? and you see <laughs> no, like they're this, just dancing all weird <laughs> this shit going on in the corner and then you realize oh no there's really and then there's like this horrible act of violence and the dj stops and everyone stops uh -huh. It's like, oh, my God, this person's dead. And they're, like, taken <laughs> out of the club and taken away. And it's, like, silent and terrible. And people are standing there. And the queen goes up to the DJ and says, play something nice. <laughs> and he's like, oh, shit. And so he just starts playing. Okay, he starts playing something. And then she starts dancing with her friends. And it's so weird and awkward and horrible. And people are like, should we do Damn, I mean, <laughs> what should we even do? This is so fucked up. So these yeah, sound did, like a blast. We had a lot of do. fun. We had a where, lot of fun. Where do you get the performers? They were all artists that I knew and had worked with. Okay. And we had uh, an ensemble together of people that had worked on shows over and over. And which is right. great because then you kind of develop a, you know, a shorthand say, remember like when the Tweedle was killed, let's do it like that. Only a little different, but yeah. I mean, it sounds, sounds like it'd be like a good opportunity for like theater majors at a local college or something or to come in and, and, and do something too. just so. during the Alice in Wonderland show, um, a local high school in the city that, that were the, the, we were performing, um, their theater group approached us and said, could we come and, you know, could we watch? Could we, you know, is there a way to come watch rehearsal? And so we had them come for every show because it's it's weird when you're making something like that. And again, it's the Dark Factory is the same way. Everything is being created in kind of a vacuum till you get people to engage with it, right? Uh -huh. So we're killing Tweedles and we're doing all this other shit, but without people there, you don't know if it's going to work. You don't yeah. know if it, it's going to come off like it should. So we said, okay, let's have these high school students come in and they could be our beta testers because we would have one beta tester night where usually it's like friends and family. You get people to come and then afterwards they stay and say, I like this. I didn't like that. Uh -huh. And the performers get to play because when they're working, it's like green screen. They don't have any people to you know perform with. So yeah, no got, one to bounce off of. No one to bounce. And that energy is not there. So when we did the the beta night for Alice and you know, all this murder and mayhem is happening and strangled <laughs> Tweedles and whatever. And these students were silent as death. <laughs> they didn't, they Freaked said them out. <laughs> nothing. And we thought afterwards, we thought, Oh my God, did we like psychologically ruin scarred, them? I mean, scarred, scarred for life. <laughs> what? Oh no. And we were, everyone was like, a, we we're all bummed out going, Oh my God. So I, I asked the teacher, afterwards and said how was it what did they think and she said are they okay oh, 
she said as soon as they got out in the parking lot they couldn't shut up they loved it they were just they were mesmerized they were this they were saying we should do stuff like this and so it's like oh my god okay okay because we didn't we didn't want to ruin them for life but i'll tell you what during that moment during that beta test while this poor little tweedle is getting murdered we had a, a character <laughs> called the carpenter like the walrus and the carpenter but our carpenter was kind of like god like the maker of all this uh-huh. and while this is happening one of the students turned to the carpenter and said carpenter make it stop <laughs> and she said that's not how this works and that was another one of those moments where you're like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because so that was the improv. There's a level of improv. To it too. And that question, right? I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's the question of always to God of human evil, right? Make it stop. Yeah. And that she had the presence to say that's not how this works. And by the way, uh, Killing Tweedles is the next book Kathy's working on. <laughs> <laughs> I know <laughs> the, the death of the Tweedle. <laughs> Killing Tweedles. But it, that kind of engagement, I who could ever have predicted a question like that, right? Who could ever have predicted a moment like that? And that's all any any live performance, a music performance, anything live, you always have the door open for that kind of stuff. So yeah, because I used to be an an actor in a haunted house. I play like Myers and stuff like that, and it's sort of not the same skill as what you're talking about, but. You know, every time someone comes into a room, it's different how they react. And oh, yeah. And all that. So I can, I sort of see what you're talking about from personal experience, but yours is on a much higher level. But it sounds but like still, a lot of no. go through. It'd be fun to act in as well. It was a lot of fun. And because so much of it was improv, it had to be. But haunted houses, those are really, that's the real deal. When people are legitimately afraid, they act yeah. out. Yeah, they do. I, yeah, they. I mean, I know people who worked in haunted houses and who got punched. I mean, yeah, that's one of the rules of the door. You, you're not allowed to touch the actors. Like we can you're touch not you, supposed but to. you're not supposed to touch us. Yeah, right. I still but, do, but yeah. Or when people right because people are scared and you see what they're what they're really and like. Some people those they think it's hilarious and they're just laughing. Other people just don't have any expression, and then people just fall to the floor. They're terrified. So you get that wide range of emotions, which is fun to play out. It, you as the actor, it's fun to play off of that, whatever they're doing. And all that energy, too, when oh, they yeah. come in and they're like all geeked for this to start happening. Uh-huh. It's a lot of fun. But, yeah, there is, there's always a risk with anything live. So, I mean, why shouldn't we? That's why when, when we were thinking about how to do Dark Factory, why shouldn't we try to bring that experience as much as we can into a, you know, a book narrative? I mean, why not? Uh-huh. So was, was Nerve, was that like a big building block for – working on dark factory, like taking that immersive experience and trying to put it into a novel. Yeah. And because I was able to see how people reacted and what people enjoyed and Mm -hmm. because sometimes the things that you think they'll really like, they don't like. So, or like you set these things up and go, well, nobody even did that. So, okay. Then I guess that's not as we thought it would be more engaging than it was. So why didn't that work? Let's don't do that next time. Let's, we did a version of Dracula where the idea was you were coming to have dinner with him while he interviews Jonathan Harker about this position. And you're sitting at the table with him in this basement. And every time the scene changes, you move one seat down. <laughs> and it, it was very effective and things happen too in those shows that we didn't expect and but mm-hmm. things also happened that we had prepared this great totally vegan completely realistic disgusting food and um, because jonathan harker doesn't get any food and you know of course dracula doesn't eat but uh-huh. we wanted food to be there and it had to be like you know good quality food if if somebody wanted to eat it it's food and you can eat it i mean after the shows we would eat it but no one ever ate it not one person (laughs) ever ate that vegan blood sausage i was so pissed off it was so good (laughs) they they just wouldn't you know so but i mean it was there and it had to be we had to think that far ahead too it's like if somebody actually wants to eat that it it has to be good yeah right and it has to be you know tasty and it should be part of a the experience if they want to eat this stuff but yeah to try to open up 
and make ways for people to engage or to, to have fun like that. I don't see why we can't translate that into, into a book. So that's, yeah. that's what we're doing. Has that been one of the most challenging parts about dark factory is to get that immersion in there? To keep trying to figure out the best ways to make it happen because, hmm. you know, we know it's there and, yeah. but yeah, to keep, opening it up and to, to make sure to leave space for people to bring their own ideas and say, well, what if, you know, what if you guys did this or what if you guys did that? So I'm, I'm hoping that people, as we go on more and more with the site, that as people engage with it, they'll come up with their own ideas. And cause I am all ears. I'm always excited to hear <laughs> how people want to engage. I'm telling you having that real dance for the dark factory on release day would be cool where people come into the real factory. We will, the, I'm not sure yet how we're going to, I know there will be guests in the studio and two, unfortunately, because of, you know, who knows where we're going to be at with plague. Hopefully all that will be over, but you have to plan yeah. as if it isn't. So right. that's where you get your dark factory mask and <laughs> know, right? Right. you got to get that brand on there. Yeah. <laughs> why why right. is that in the swag bag? I know. <laughs> really? See, there you go. There's an idea that we didn't think of. <laughs> But we will be doing some bookstore show tomorrow. <laughs> events. Some of the events will be um, part live and part streamed. And two, yeah. to make sure that as many people want to take advantage of it as, as can. But uh -huh. we'll have to see how it plays out. And like any, like any club, you know, anything can happen at the club. So, <laughs> so is it, is it still a ghost story? Like it was originally supposed to be, or has that changed some mm -mm. change? It, it still has uh, an extra natural component, I think, but it is not. No, all, and all those people were super mean, and it became difficult to even sit down with that material every day because they were so awful. And mm -hmm. the, the story in that book was this woman was taking part in like a paranormal um, experiment that everybody but her knew was fake and they were so mean to her and i thought yeah, i no it and it was it was not and she was not the sharpest tool in the shed either so it was like <laughs> easy to fool her and yeah it was it was really nasty so it's like and, and then we went into like a very dark year so it's like maybe i i was feeling some of that or whatever bad things were on the horizon but yeah, not everything that you want to work on, too. You can, I'm sure every every writer has had that experience, or most of us, things that you would like to do, sometimes you can't. Uh -huh. Or you, you start working on something, and it's just, it's not something you can do. So just now you were talking about these characters like they're real people. Do you, when you're writing and get immersed into your own stories, do you feel like they are real people? Like you are saying, they're so mean, and this one was not the sharpest tool in the shed. Do right. they feel real to you? They do feel real. They have to feel real or otherwise I can't, I can't follow what they're going to do. And there's no you room. Tell us these are people, you know, right? No, <laughs> that I can't do. That I can't do. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I can't go one-on-one -on -one like that. I've written one novel about an actual person. It's called Christopher Wilde. It's about Christopher Marlowe. And that was a totally different, that was very hard in a different way because it is a real person. And, you know, it's a biographical novel. And so you have to, not only are you getting the facts straight, but you feel like you're responsible for this person's, you're representing this person and someone who might never read anything else about them. You want to do it. You want to do them justice and be respectful. Uh -huh. <laughs> <You want? laughs> this is great. I'm reading the comments. Rob, he's an author too. You should read his uh, stuff is good as well. Uh, the Samuel L. Jackson of Cutching Pumpkins. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, especially when the little kids come in and scare you. I am surprised that my cat has not been in here yet. Because I know he's out there. He's like, Do you know how late it is? Do you know? I haven't eaten for almost two hours. I was gonna say, are you yeah. gonna walk out to a mess like a there? I could death. die. I could die right now. It's never happened, but I could. It's like, okay, I know, I know. I'm on it. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> Would you, yeah. you want to play a, a quick game and then you can do, you said you wanted to do a reading, a short reading as well? Yes, I will play a quick game. Okay, we're going to do Let's a play. lightning round. Okay, I'm ready. So 
I think I've got like 15 questions, and Jay does 60 seconds oh, yeah, and yeah. try to get through. My part is to get through as this. many as you, if I can find my phone. Where'd it go? Okay. Wait, I gotta find a clock. I don't know why I'm not prepared for this. <laughs> Where's my phone? All right, let me get the question. Jay, let me know when you're ready. All right, I'm ready. Are you ready? Hold on. We got to play our fan. This is what all our budget goes to, Kathy. We have this really <laughs> fancy intro. Okay. I'm and we ready. Spend all our, we spend all our money on it. <laughs> That's all our budget right there. <laughs> okay. We're going 60 seconds, right? Okay. I'm ready. Seconds. I'm ready. Ready? ready. First thing pops in your head, just answer. Okay. And ready? go. If you could talk with any artist, living or dead, who would it be? Christopher Marlowe. What's your desert island book? Wuthering Heights. What's your favorite holiday? Uh, Easter. Wow, that's weird. <laughs> if, you could have one, <laughs> if you could have one superpower, what would it be? Invisibility. What's your favorite band? Sigur Rós. What book would be your dream to adapt for Nerve? Mm. I already did it. It was Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights. Nice. Favorite food? Coffee. If you could meet any of your characters in real life, who would it be? Ari. I love Ari. What's your favorite horror movie? Uh, Pan's Labyrinth. What would your weapon of choice be in the zombie apocalypse? The garbage can. <laughs> <laughs> What's your dream vacation spot? Five seconds. Berlin. If you weren't an author, what would you want to be doing? Nothing. I'm <laughs> yeah, no, that's what is, everyone wants to do. Nothing. No, no, but no, I, I, yeah, I, I have to do this. I can't take it a nap. <laughs> can't be anything else. I can't be anything else. No, if I wasn't this, I, I, I'm not anything. What did you do before you started writing? Before you were an author, did you have like a normal kind, of like nine to five kind of job? Or? I did. I did. I had a normal job um, up until I was twenty three, twenty four. And I went to the Clarion Writers Workshop, which at the time was held at Michigan State. And after that, I came back and quit my job. So, <laughs> so you okay. had one of, those, one of those aha moments. Where... I totally had an aha moment. And it was like, okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. So I better get busy and start doing it. But yeah, that's why. And that's one of the reasons I know it is, is very difficult and everybody has different circumstances, but that's why for me, I always believed in do quit your day job because mm -hmm. that was what proved to me that I was taking stuff seriously, that I was yeah. willing to, you know, shove in all the chips and take it really seriously. So sometimes that we, you know, it depends on everyone's life circumstances, but it's important to do the thing that tells you that you're serious about what you're doing and yeah. you're willing to, to go all in to take that step. It's a big step. Author Hamlin bird sort of has a question playing off that he wants to know was a uh, cipher, your first manuscript. And then what was the process of breaking through like for you? Cipher was not the first novel that I wrote. Um, and haha, -ha, they're burned now. So <laughs> no one will ever read that. But, yeah, I had brought a novel with me to the to the writer's workshop, and I realized after a week that it was so bad that I was <laughs> never showing anyone, so I never took it out of my suitcase. Um, from the time that I went to Clarion to the time that I sold the novel, was it, it took several years, and most of that was about writing short fiction and mm -hmm. sending stuff out and getting it rejected and then, you know, getting better rejections and then being able to get an agent and, and sell the novel. And some of that too was fortuitous timing. Um, the, the Dell Abyss program that I was fortunate enough to be part of and to be the, the lead off book for, um, you know, that was obviously had been in the works and Gene Cavellis was out, you know, looking for interesting and unusual horror novels. And so mm -hmm. it, you know, it worked out well. It was, it was good timing, but that no one could have, you know, obviously I didn't know that when I was working yeah. on it. When I gave the, the manuscript to my agent, my then agent, um, he said, well, Kathy, if you have the balls to write this, I have the balls to sell it. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he did. So, so we did, we both, we both did. 
Did you have um, like short stories and stuff published before Cypher or was Cypher like the first thing you had? Pub- okay. Yeah, no, I had had, um, and at the time I was writing a lot of science, like kind of quasi science fiction. So they were in a lot of the science fiction magazines and uh, anthologies and they were getting good notice and people were starting to know my byline. So yeah, it was, it was the, it was the first novel from the fabled abyss line. And she had some really great books. Jean had a really good eye. And yes, they did. They had a really beautiful book design. And one of the one of the things that I didn't know enough about at the time, I didn't understand, is how unique her vision was and how hard she had to work to kind of shepherd and you know keep that keep that vision as pure as she could and get the books that she wanted to. And again, you know, you have to get a book out every month. So right. uh-huh. you can imagine the amount of reading and the amount of winnowing and, you know, the stuff that she had to do and the, the voices that she had in the abyss line were pretty great. She had some yeah. really great writers. I just, I, I was watching, I think it was like your Patreon video or some video. You said you had 17 novels maybe 18 now with dark factory, but yet a mm-hmm. gazillion gazillion short stories. It just made me laugh. How many short stories you read? There's so many. And I don't even remember them all to be honest. <laughs> they're like, they're out there. And I, I, I'm was glad that they're one day. Yeah. Oh, I, I, I wrote that. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Right. When I was putting the things together and the velocities is if I can reach it from here, can I reach it from here? Because my first collection, um, Extremities, came out a long time ago. And when it was time to do another one, um, I started looking through the stories again and going, oh, yeah, that's (laughs) pretty good. I should put that in there. That's a good book. All right. Um, So is there a range of like years of when these stories in this book are written? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no. Some are super, super contemporary to right now, and some are not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read a little bit from Baby because I won't read the whole thing. But but Baby is a Baby is a very Baby is definitely a a a strange story. It's definitely a horror story. It's about a young. I just finished reading that one. I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah, and then I mean, it is in velocities and. I would for sure say it's a horror story, but it's also it's a very sad story in a lot of ways. This is a, it almost this, has this this small fantasy element to it too, without without trying to spoil anything. Stop, Brad. Let me read it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to read. I won't read all of it. I will read a little bit. Um, okay. It's kind of funny that I never called you anything else, just baby. Funny that I even found you up there in Grammy storage space or crawl space or whatever it's called, and it's not really an attic. Boxes were piled up everywhere, but mostly all I'd found were old china cup and saucer sets and a bunch of games with missing pieces, Stratego and Monopoly and Clue. I already had Clue at home. I used to totally love Clue, even though I cheated when I played sometimes. Well, all the time. I wanted to win. Anyway, there were boxes and boxes of Grampy's old books, doctor books. One of them was called Surgical Procedures and Facial Deformities. And believe me, you did not want to look at that. I flipped it open in one picture where this guy's mouth. Yeah. Anyway, after that, I stayed away from the boxes of books. But then I found you, baby, stuffed down in a big box of clothes, chiffon scarves and unraveling lace old shirts like army uniforms. At the bottom of the box were all kinds of shoes and a couple of satin evening bags. At first I thought you were a kind of purse too, all small and yellow and leathery. But then I turned you over and I saw you had a face. Your slick wrinkled skin, weird old timey doll with glass eyes. They looked like glass and fingers they could open and close. The first time you did that fastened on me like that, it kind of flipped me out. But then I saw I could make you do it if I wanted to. And then I wanted to. 
I played with you for a long time that first day, finding out what you could do until mommy came and bitched me out for being missing. How big was Grammy's house? Not very. Mommy was just mad that she had to be there at all. Even once a year was too much for her. Mommy and Grammy never really got along. Speak English, Mommy used to yell at her. This is Ohio. So when she yelled at me, I wasn't surprised. What are you doing up here? With the door open and the afternoon light behind her like a witch peering into a playhouse. I knew to hide you, baby, even though I didn't know why. And I'm just playing dress up, I said. But Mommy got mad at that, too. Stay out of that stuff, all her Nazi dance hall stuff. It's all moth-eaten and disgusting. And anyway, come on, we're leaving now. So that's kind of a clue, in a way, from where where baby comes from, where this yeah. baby doll comes from. It's this such Nazi a cool story. Stuff. I'm and, fascinated and, with Nazi stuff. I don't like it's so it's, intriguing, just everything they did. And there's so much pent up evil in these you know even in these old clothes and i mean what does it even mean nazi dance hall stuff right i mean like wait what how does that fit with those weird doctor things that you just told us or these books with these horrible pictures how does that fit together right and so all those pieces are there and you can put them together any way you want. And, you know, she, she doesn't, Janie mm -hmm. doesn't, she just accepts things. And as kids do, I mean, you, you're a kid, you're in this world and things are often new to you. Right. And you don't mm -hmm. understand till later, maybe what's going on. So, but yeah, baby was, baby was a story that, and baby is a story that when I read it, um, people always have a response to it. So, yeah, it's something weird because as we start winding down here, people are just now tuning in. They're going to think, have they been talking about Nazis for the last I know. hour? Nazi dance minutes? hall? Yeah. What? Like, what? What, show, what show does paper cuts become now? I Nazi know, right? <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> like, just that, just that one nugget of mm -hmm. information, though, like, had my mind going all different places. And whether, I won't say whether you explain it or not, in my head, I was like, oh, this is maybe from this or this is what's going on. And just that one spark of ima imagination that you add in, instead of info dumping and tell me all about it, you let me go where I wanted to go with it. Figure it out. And we've all done stuff like go through things that we had no idea, you know, what we were looking at. Or, you know, you're a kid. You're a kid. You're going through stuff. Sometimes they are distances, right? I am everywhere. And actually distances <laughs> is... She's omnipresent. <laughs> I am. I'm, She's out your window right now. That's right. I'm in your kitchen, actually, looking to see if you have any fresh coffee made because <laughs> I'm out right now. But yeah, actually, Distances was the story that uh, my agent wanted me to develop into a novel. And that's where uh, Nicholas came from. That turned into the fun hole. So that stuff's everywhere. Our work is everywhere. Do I have a character yep. that I feel particularly attached to? Um because Dark Factory is what I'm working on now, I'm attached to them. But of all the characters in that book, uh, Ari Regan is the is the character I I'm bonded to right now. So, <laughs> what do you love about Meerkat oh, Press? Oh, what do I love about Meerkat Press? Only everything. <laughs> I so have they, a, are they putting out all your old stuff too, like Cipher and Bad Brains and all that stuff? Or just... No, but they did um, Meerkat Press published, republished Cypher with, okay. uh, and a, with a new afterword by the very great Maurice Meyer. And if you mm -hmm. don't know her work, you definitely should, should. Her latest book is a novel called The Seventh Mansion. And it is so weird. It is beyond weird. And it's very beautiful and just very strange. And I, I love her work a lot. Um, Meerkat published that and they published Velocities. And what I'm finding with working with Trisha Reeks there is again, that she is so brave and so creative and so willing to look at work and say, what can we make this be, you know, rather than, Oh, this is the way we do things. And so we're going to have to like squish dark factory into this box. Cause this is the way we do things. She was like, yeah, throw the boxes away. Let's just make something happen fun. 
and that kind of level of bravery and and independence really i mean that's what indie publishing can do that a lot of the giant houses the big five or big four or whatever it is now and the yeah they've well now there's i guess there's going to be an antitrust uh thing with doj says you can't be like one giant publisher that's not cool yeah so someone's trying to buy simon and schuster i can't remember who it is but they tried to block it the other day right to say this is not cool you, you yeah not a good idea so but yeah they do not have that kind of freedom they don't have their armature is just too big right it's like mm-hmm. trying to turn a battleship you know or a big cruise ship you know they're just not nimble and they they can't no offense they're fine but they can't <laughs> do what an indie publisher can do so yeah that i i love meerkat yeah the authors we've talked to most of them have been in these small press and it's just the freedom of that they can pick their own cover art or they don't have to edit this out because it might not go well with the audience or they could just do whatever they want to and there are less levels of of bureaucracy above you and less gatekeepers more more hands in, in your pot than right and so much of even when I was was doing my YA books, um, <laughs> I worked with an editor, Frances Foster, is a, a wonderful, le- pretty legendary editor in YA. And because she had her own imprint, there was one less level of bureaucracy to fight through. But she mm-hmm. still had people to answer to, right? I mean, yeah. even though she was Frances Foster, she still had to, you know, say, "Well, I'm acquiring these books because blah blah blah." And uh-huh. where it's like, she's Frances Foster. Just let her do whatever she wants. She's <laughs> fucking genius. Just leave her alone. <laughs> but that, you know, that's not how it works. So, so it sounds like you found a, a perfect spot with Meerkat to put Dark Factory out. Because, like I said, it sounds utterly unique. And then everything behind it, the website and the, its own Twitter account, just sounds like marketing for a book that I've never seen to this level. Like, you see, like, book trailers and stuff. Right. This is this is like another level of it. Yeah, it's a whole different con- new concept. It's, a, for me it's almost really meta because you're having your your characters in the book interviewing real people, and then real people interviewing your characters. It is it's extremely meta, and it's I mean it's supposed to be doing the same thing that those shows did. It's just keep yeah. blurring that line between what's real, and that's kind of what the book is about too. It's like where does reality end, and does it end somewhere other than we have always been kind of taught to believe or that we have always taught ourselves to believe. So, but not to spoil it. No spoilers. So so this is May 22nd, correct? May 2022. May 2022. May That's what I meant. May 2022. (laughs) All those twos. twos. (laughs) Too many twos. Too many twos. Yeah. Yeah. So right next May. We don't don't want to keep you from uh, feeding your cat. Okay. Yeah, I, just, I, just, I, just know, I just know you're going to walk out to a mess and it's going to be, you're going to be like, damn, paper cuts kept me so long. <laughs> he's, he's, I know he'll be out there going, you're dead to me. You're yeah. dead to me. Yeah, Go ahead, fill the bowl, but dad. We cannot thank you enough for being on tonight. Where yeah, can, uh, where can the listeners to watchers find you? Not, I don't mean your home. I mean, as far as <laughs> as far as I'm going to be in the kitchen exactly. with the cat. So if yeah. you want to come, come in there, your, your um, social media, Instagram, Twitter, all that. You can stuff. find me on Twitter. You can find me on Facebook. Um, go to darkfactory.club and look at the club. And there's also Kathy You can email me there anytime and I will see it and I will answer. Nice. Nice. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, so you for much. having really me. Really appreciate it. It's been a fun episode. What do you say, Brad? It's been pretty fun. It's, it's been a blast. I honestly, I reached out to Kathy for to see if she wanted to do the 31 Days of Horror readings. And she's like, well, why don't we just do an interview instead? It's like, Poof. it was fun. I, I'm I, glad. Honestly, Thank I, you for I never. I never thought you would even answer me. <laughs> Who are, who's this random person messaging me on Twitter? Not even. He's going to answer us when we reach out. We're like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was, you know, we're all trying to do the same thing. And no, I that would have been very rude if I didn't answer you. I'm I'm not rude, Brad. I'm or just not rude. Or at least block you. I mean, <laughs> yeah, just block, mute me or something. No, but thank you so much no. for coming on. This was this was an absolute pleasure. It was thank a blast you, yes. to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. So for every, everyone in the chat, thank you so much for coming by on this Friday night, even after that week uh, show from last week, <laughs> coming back and, and joining us after that show. Really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, for our special guest this evening, Kathy Koja, my co-host Brad Proctor. I'm Jay. This has been another exciting episode of Paper Cuts. Until we meet again, stay safe. See ya.
Bye. Bye, guys. Love you, Jay.